Jesus lived and ministered during one of the most violent and polarized moments in Jewish history. And yet he was still able to connect with people all over the political and social spectrum and invite them into discipleship under him. And in Jesus in Galilee part six, we're gonna see how he did that and the vision that he gave for bringing God's kingdom in a totally new way. Hello everyone, we are going to look at one final group that Jesus would have encountered during his life and ministry around the Sea of Galilee. And rather than just tell you who they are and what their mentality is, I wanna tell you some stories of what was happening around the Sea of Galilee before, during, and after the life of Jesus. So imagine that we are standing here on top of Mount Arbel and we turn around and we peer over the edge of this cliff and we're gonna see this. It's a couple hundred feet, a sheer rock face. Uh, when we lead trips to Israel, we hike up to Mount Arbel from the bottom and you can see what that rock face looks like from below. And it's just pockmarked with hundreds of caves. And in the generation before Jesus, these caves were filled with Jewish families, but not just any Jewish families. These were families who were participating in an insurgency against the Romans and against Herod. These were people who had a deep sense of animosity and resentment towards the Roman expansion and all of the oppression that that brought into their lives. And so, after Herod the Great is made king of the Jews, he comes here to settle some old scores. And Herod knew he couldn't attack the folks from below, that that would just be awful. Uh, he also knew he couldn't send his troops climbing down from above, that would be a suicide mission. So Herod, ever the engineer, designed these crates and he filled these crates with his soldiers and they lowered the crates over the edge of the cliff where his soldiers would throw fire into the caves and basically would smoke out these rebels who would begin to choke and need oxygen. And when they would come to the edge of the caves, the soldiers would take a grappling hook and pull the people out of the caves where they would fall hundreds of feet to their death. Now, the historian Josephus tells us that this campaign went on for days, and on one of these days, Herod was overseeing, and he saw an older Jewish man at the mouth of a cave. And Herod offered this man and his family safe passage. But instead of receiving Herod's offer, this man, one by one, killed his seven children, killed his wife, and then killed himself. I mean, what? kind of violence and fury has to live inside your heart for that to happen. And that is happening around the Sea of Galilee before the time of Jesus. Now, after Herod dies, his kingdom is gonna be split up amongst his three sons, and Brad talked about this in a previous episode. And as Brad mentioned, Archelaus, Herod's son, who ruled this territory, was so brutal, so inept, that Caesar Augustus sends him into exile and annexes his kingdom into a new Roman province called Judea. And what does a Caesar do when he adds new territory to his kingdom? Well, of course, he's going to tax it. And so he held a census. And how do you think that's going to go over? In a country that already is engaged in armed resistance against you? Yeah, it does not go well. And so in 6 AD, a guy by the name of Judas the Galilean, who we talked about in the episode where we looked at the Herodians of Tiberias, Judas the Galilean begins this armed revolt in response to the census. And Judas actually shows up in our New Testament in the book of Acts, chapter five. And it's a story where Peter and the apostles have been brought in before the Sanhedrin and they're being questioned. And while this is taking place, one of the members of the Jewish council by the name of Gamaliel stands up and he gives a speech. And during his speech, he says, after him, Judas the Galilean rose up at the time of the census and got people to follow him. He also perished and all who followed him were scattered. Now, he shows up in our New Testament sources, 
But I want to talk about Judas the Galilean more because of where he's from and his family. So a number of scholars contest that Judas's father was a guy by the name of Hezekiah. And Hezekiah was also a Jewish rebel who believed that you brought the kingdom of God with the sword. In fact, Hezekiah had messianic hopes for himself, and he ends up being put to death by Herod the Great. He's beheaded, captured. Judas leads his revolt. He's captured, put to death. But we learn from Josephus that Judas has two sons by the name of James and Simon who participate in a revolt and they're also captured and crucified by the Romans. And then in another of Josephus's writing, we learn about another son or potentially grandson of Judas the Galilean named Menahem. And Menahem was one of the leaders of the Jewish resistance against the Romans during the war with Rome in 66 to 70 AD. And so you just look at this family and we've got three, possibly four generations of violent armed resistance against the Romans. And where is this family from? Well, they are from Gamla, which is in the region of Galanitis, just northeast of the shore of the Sea of Galilee. And you can get a picture of what Gamla would have looked like here. It's this ridge top town tucked between these really, really deep gorges. You can only approach the town from one direction. When you look a little closer, at the site of the ancient city, you get a sense for just how steep it was, built right on top of that cliff, butted right up to the edge, and you can see where the wall was. And the reason that Gamla is going to become such a poster child for the group of people we're talking about in this episode is not just because Judas is from here, but it's because in 67 AD, this is going to become the site of one of the most definitive battles between the Jewish rebels and the forces of the Roman Empire. And you can see this artist rendering of the battle and the Jewish rebels put up a good fight, but in the end, the Romans break through and you can read Josephus's account of this battle. We'll link to it in the show notes if you wanna read that for yourselves, it's really interesting. But the Romans break through and 4,000 Jews are killed in the fighting. But when the fighting is just about over, there are 5,000 Jewish men, women, and children who rush to the top of the city where rather than surrender to the Romans, 5,000 of them jump off the steep edge of the city to their death in the cliff below. And this is not the last time during the Jewish war that we're going to see something like this because in 73 or 74 AD, we're not sure which year it is, the Romans, and you can see their siege ramp here, are going to surround Masada, where some holdover zealots had camped out. And when the Romans finally break through, 960 of these Jewish rebels choose to commit suicide rather than surrender. And this militant extremist resistance to the Romans, it comes from a group that we're, we know as the Zealots. And we're just gonna refer to them as these religious extremists who believe that the kingdom of God came by force. In fact, there was a subgroup of the Zealots known as the Sicarii, and they got that name from these. Now these are $7.99 on amazon.com if you are on a prop budget like we are, but these are CK, and it just means curved dagger, and so the Sicarii are the daggermen. And they're essentially a group of assassins or terrorists who conceal in their clothing these daggers, and then they find the person that they want to assassinate, and in broad daylight, in a crowded city street, in a busy marketplace, they will walk up to this person, unsheath their dagger, stab them in the heart, and conceal it in their cloak, and melt again back into the crowd. And by doing this, they just created so much fear and terror. And this was the mindset of these zealots. Now, I wanna walk you through three core convictions of the zealot mentality. And the first core conviction is just 
no ruler but God. And so Josephus gives a, a little more color to that, and he says, these men agree in all other things with Pharisaic notions. So they believe like the Pharisees. And in fact, when Judas the Galilean led his revolt, he teamed up with a Pharisee named Saduk. So they have all that faithful belief in the scriptures, but they pair it with this willingness to do violence. And Josephus goes on, they have an inviolable attachment to liberty and say that God is to be their only ruler and Lord. So core conviction number one, no ruler but God. Core conviction number two, no idolatry. And that meant essentially no paying taxes. Because as we talked about in the episode on the Herodians of Tiberius, you paid the census tax with a silver denarius. And the denarius would have an image of Caesar on it, and it would usually be accompanied by this message that said, Caesar is Lord. Well, that's idolatry, so there is no paying taxes. Core conviction number three, these people are willing to use violence to eliminate the Romans and bring God's kingdom. They're absolutely willing to kill Roman soldiers, Roman citizens, but they're also willing to kill their own Jewish countrymen who they see as collaborating with the Romans. Think Sadducees, the wealthy aristocratic priestly families who want to maintain good relations with the Romans. Think Herodians. Uh, think especially tax collectors. Tax collectors are these Jewish men who have basically sold themselves to the Romans and are extorting their fellow Jewish countrymen and getting rich off of them in the process. They would have been prime targets for the zealots. But I think what's hard for us to swallow is they're not just willing to use violence against these folks, but zealots are willing to use violence against themselves and their own families. And as unconscionable as that might seem to you and I, it's really important to remember that this group of people during Jesus' lifetime, they were deeply admired. Um, Eugene Peterson says that zealots believed they were committed to a cause which they believed was God's cause. They had a vision for a better world and were ready to die for it. We must remember that zealots were popular heroes among the Jews. And the reason for that is they kept alive this Jewish tradition or heritage known as zeal. And it's the Hebrew word kana. Uh, it means to be jealous, envious, zealous, furious. So they are the kanaim. And really the poster child for this tradition of zeal is a guy by the name of Phineas. And we read about Phineas in Numbers chapter 25, where the men of Israel fall into idolatry and they're committing sexual immorality with the women of Moab and Midian. And in this particular story, a man brings his Midianite woman into the Israelite camp in front of everybody in front of Moses, in front of everybody that's looking on, and begins to be sexually intimate with her. And Phineas sees this and begins to burn with rage, with kana. And he grabs a spear, he runs over, and he drives this spear through the two of them, killing them. And we learn what God thinks about this in Numbers 25, when the Lord said to Moses, Phinehas, son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the priest, has turned my anger away from the Israelites, for he was as zealous as I am for my honor among them, so that in my zeal, I did not put an end to them. So you see in this tradition of zeal, there is this idea of what I want to call the myth of redemptive violence, that we can use violence to prevent more violence. You see this also with another zealous hero, Elijah, who has this contest, this showdown with the prophets of Baal, and he puts 450 prophets of Baal to death by the sword. And then we find him shortly thereafter praying to God. He says, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. So again, it's that coming together of faithfulness and violence. And then this crystallizes uh, in the second century BC with a guy by the name of Mattathias. And in Mattathias' lifetime, the Seleucid king Antiochus IV Epiphanes 
unlike Alexander the Great, he is going to try to force the Jewish population to take on Hellenism as a way of life. He outlaws circumcision. He disallows people to practice Sabbath. He doesn't allow people to offer sacrifices to God in the temple. He sets up an altar to Zeus and sacrifices pigs on that altar in the temple of Jerusalem and then begins to compel other people in the Jewish countryside to do the same on the threat of death. And it's in the book of Maccabees where his henchmen come to this Jewish village of Modein and they try to get this guy by the name of Mattathias to make a sacrifice and he refuses. And we pick up the story here. When he had finished speaking these words, a Jew came forward in the sight of all to offer a sacrifice on the altar in Modein. According to the king's command, when Mattathias saw it, he burned with zeal, and his heart was stirred. He gave vent to righteous anger. He ran and killed him on the altar. This is Phineas 2.0. And Mattathias' actions are going to spark the Maccabean revolt, where against all odds, the Jewish resistance wins its independence from the Seleucid Empire and for the next 103 years enjoys their freedom and autonomy until who shows up? The Romans. And the burning question in Jesus' day when there's all of this support for the Roman resist, uh, resistance against Rome, when there's this hotbed of animosity and hatred and religious violence, the burning question is, where is this rabbi on the matter? This rabbi who can multiply loaves, who can heal people, would be a real asset in a battle with the Romans. Where is Jesus on this? And I just want to point out two things to you that we can observe from the life of Jesus that give an answer to that question. And the first comes from who Jesus chose as his disciples. And in Matthew chapter 10, we read this list of disciples. These are the names of the 12 apostles. First, Simon, who's called Peter, his brother Andrew, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas. And then we get this, Matthew, the tax collector. So Jesus has a tax collector as one of his followers. James, the son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus, Simon, the zealot. You've got a zealot and a tax collector. He wants to kill him. He's stealing money from all of them. What in the world? And they come together as disciples of Jesus. And then, of course, we've got Judas Iscariot. Now, there are some people who say that this word Iscariot is the, the Hebrew ish for man and Kariot, the, the town of Kariot, which was located in Judea. Some scholars believe that that was a center of zealotry. And if that was the case, then Judas may also be a zealot. We don't know for sure. But what we do know is that Jesus calls these two disciples, Matthew, the tax collector, and Simon the Zealot. And I just wonder, was Jesus always intentionally pairing them together? When he sent them out two by two, no, 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 you two are going together. D did he make them eat together? Did he make them talk together? Was there just this idea that even in the people that Jesus chose to follow him, he's making the point that in an angry, polarized world, as my disciple, you will see that persons are more important than politics or positions. And you see this bear out in his discipleship group. But then there's this other dimension to Jesus' teachings. And I think if you were a zealot and you went to hear Jesus' Sermon on the Mount and you're thinking, where is Jesus in all of this? And you sit down and start to listen and he begins, blessed are the meek for they will inherit the earth. <laughs> I mean, whoa, Jesus, no, 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 no. The legions inherit the earth. The swords inherit the earth. And you're thinking, okay, I'll give this guy a chance. And he, he continues, if somebody strikes you on one cheek, turn to him the other also. I mean, you're starting to bristle with rage. I don't like where this is going. If somebody forces you to carry his pack one mile, which by law a Roman soldier could do, you choose to go the second. Now I think any zealot in the crowd has gone into like a silent rage. They're not even responding to what they're hearing Jesus say. And then Jesus continues, love your enemies. 
I mean, I, I just wonder, what does a zealot do when they hear Jesus say, anybody who's gonna follow me needs to take up his cross and follow me? No, Jesus, the cross is a political symbol. That's what the Romans do to people. The cross mean, means that Rome has won. We need to put them on crosses. And this is just not Jesus' mindset. I think Jesus understands that violence cannot stop violence. That violence always begets more violence. And the way you bring an end to violence is that it has to have a place to go to die. And Jesus says the place that happens is the cross, not because you put a Roman there, but because you put your own hatred there. I think that you could just say for Jesus, true zeal isn't about killing the enemies around us. It's about allowing the cross of Christ to put to death the enemy within us. And nobody that I know of represents this idea and embodies Jesus' teaching on this better than Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And in one of his famous sermons, Loving Your Enemies, he says these words, there is a little tree planted on a little hill, and on that tree hangs the most influential character that ever came in this world. It is an eternal reminder to a generation depending on violence that love is the only creative, redemptive, transforming power in the universe. And I'm foolish enough to believe that through the power of this love, somewhere, men of the most recalcitrant bent will be transformed. And my friends, at our moment in history, in a culture that is deeply angry and deeply polarized, we can share in this power of the cross that doesn't vilify others and perpetuate the cycle of anger and violence, but we can take up our cross and we can allow the cross to put to death the hatred that lives in us. May you walk out this text well in your life.